Hello, everybody. Um, what's what is going on here? Hello, everyone. Uh, boy, have I had more technological problems today than I can uh, remember. So I I had some problems doing this uh, uh, initially. So here it goes again. A uh, quick chapter review for you guys. You have a quiz tomorrow. There's a lot here, so I'm going to try to go through it as quickly as I can. And I, and even then, I might run out of time. I keep it to 15 minutes. Uh, and let's see what else. The screen, uh, the voice thread is posted for you as well, and, and I hope everything's working for you. I, I did have some uh, technological glitches tonight. So when we look at these two chapters, I tried to organize it in a way that kind of made sense. And it seemed to me that there was three... Uh, overriding uh, ways of looking at the content of this chapter and one was Washington and the early foundations of the Constitution now we talked a lot about this the constitutional compromises the great compromise the three-fifths compromise the commerce compromise we talked about Roger Sherman and specifically the great compromise we talked a little bit about the Electoral College and we saw how the great compromise mirrors the concerns that the Electoral College tries to address and those concerns being the balance between large populations and small states uh, populations and how small states can get a degree of representation uh, without being overshadowed and overwhelmed by the large states. So we see that in both the Great Compromise and the Electoral College. Um, moving on to Washington. So the Constitution is passed. Washington's the first president. As such, he's going to establish a number of traditions. One of those is going to be to have a cabinet. And Washington, who's above party, who doesn't get involved in political parties, who actually opposes political parties, puts two people who are diametrically opposed uh, to each other in his cabinet. And he's able to kind of get both of these brilliant men uh, to help him lead the country. Hamilton deals with economic issues. Jefferson is the Secretary of State. And the two, these two guys, as, as we talked a lot about today in class, uh, are really going to shape a lot of the discord that we have today and have had throughout American history. Um, some of Washington's precedents, one is the two-term tradition. Um, Washington steps down after two terms, establishing this idea. And of course, when Washington does it, what other president would dare serve for a third? And we can rattle off a, a bunch that could have. Jefferson could have run for a third, but chose not to. Madison, Monroe, Andrew Jackson, just to name a few. Um, it's not until FDR, of course, in World War II that he decides to run for a third and then a fourth, dying in office. Later, the 22nd Amendment is passed. If you've ever wondered, how come no other president, how come Bill Clinton, a fairly young guy, never ran for a third term? It's because the 22nd Amendment made it law. So Washington, it was a precedent. It was a... a it was something that was done, uh, but it wasn't necessarily law. The 22nd Amendment, of course, made it law. Washington, uh, who has both Hamilton and Jefferson as advisors, generally sides with Hamilton on most issues, and he goes along with Hamilton's plan. Hamilton's plan included a strong national bank. It included paying off those, those bonds. Uh, it included an assumption of state debt. It included a strong protective tariff, and it included a tax on whiskey. Hamilton believed that uh, they needed a strong government, they needed a more active government, especially in terms of economic affairs. Um, we see the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, the tax on the whiskey, you know, in America, people rebel. We have the American Revolution, we have, uh, before that, we have Bacon's Rebellion, we have Shays' Rebellion. Uh, Americans were accustomed to rebelling when they had unfair taxes. What's very interesting about the Whiskey Rebellion is that Washington sends Hamilton down with an army, and the Whiskey Rebellion is put down without a shot being fired. Now compare that to Shays' Rebellion, which illustrated the weakness of uh, the Articles of Confederation. Remember the opening lines to uh, the Constitution, where it says to establish domestic tranquility. In other words, that's a nice way of saying we're not going to have rebellions anymore. If you have a problem with the federal government, our revolutions, our rebellions are going to take place in the voting booth now. Um, and that's what made the Whiskey Rebellion so important. Earlier, I talked about the assumption of state debt. Not all states had that much debt. We talked about this in class, so I'll, I'll say it quickly. The South, for example, had very little debt. The North had a lot. So why would the South ever agree to this? And Jefferson, who's really the representative, 
representative of the South, agreed to it only because the capital was later moved to uh, the South. Today, of course, it's in Washington, D.C. Um, when we look at Washington, and we're really talking about Washington's presidency right now, foreign policy is a very important issue. And the French Revolution played uh, an integral role in shaping George Washington's uh, foreign policy. And not only George Washington's foreign policy, but the foreign policy that will become uh, the dominant foreign policy of America for the next 150 years. And what's interesting about the French Revolution is that, in terms of America, is that you might recall that France helped us win our revolution. Now France is in some trouble of, of their own and they appeal to Washington for help. Washington issues this proclamation of neutrality saying, essentially, I'm sorry France, we appreciate the help, but we can't help you. We're remaining neutral. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to anger France, and that's going to have uh, repercussions of, it, of its own uh, later on. Um, we start to see the beginnings of that with this guy right here, Citizen Genet. He was a real character, Citizen Genet, and even his moniker, right, Citizen Genet, he's trying to say that he's a citizen. He, he's not a part of the French government. So his actions are independent. He can do whatever he wanted. What was he doing exactly? Well, he was trying to go around Washington's proclamation of neutrality. And the thing to remember here is, it's hard to kind of put this into context today because it's so strange to think like this. But back then, this was an untested government. So, and states still believed and still exercised a tremendous amount of independent authority. So Citizen Genet believed that he could appeal directly to the states. If Washington, uh, literally and figuratively, not only George Washington, but the capital, uh, which isn't around yet, but you get the idea, the government, Washington isn't going to help the French. Maybe the individual states will. Washington had Genet jailed. Washington threatened to, to send Genet back to France. And of course, as, as things had, had progressed with the French Revolution, it had, begun, it had become very bloody. Genet had... Uh, had ended up on the wrong side of, of the leaders of the French Revolution and they were going to send him to the guillotine so he really didn't want to go back to France and this whole thing was quelled. Once again it's it's just a, an a example of Washington's commitment to neutrality. Another example of Washington's commitment to neutrality is Jay's treaty. John Jay goes to England to try to negotiate a treaty with England regarding something known as impressment. We're going to talk a lot about impressment uh, over the next couple of weeks, but impressment is this idea that a foreign ship would stop and board an American ship and essentially uh, hijack some of their crew, force them to serve in the British Navy, and later the French are going to do this to us uh, as well. You know, I said the French weren't very happy with us, so the French will do this to us as well. So Jay goes there to negotiate a treaty to end this horrible uh, practice. Jay comes back. And the treaty says nothing about impressment. Americans were angered. Ah, that's embarrassing. That's my phone going off. Um, and Americans were angered. How could Jay do this and not uh, come back with, with anything substantial? It illustrates, you know, when you're negotiating a treaty, you need to have leverage. So if you want something, you need to be able to push the other side and, and with perhaps a threat. And Jay was unable to threat uh, to threaten England because Jay knew that Washington would not support getting involved in any foreign war. Um, now, as is often the case, um, the masses are angry, but this, this treaty ended up having some real positive effects. It didn't have any positive effects in terms of, of what it said. It was a pretty uh, innocuous treaty. It didn't really say a whole lot, and, and nothing important anyway, uh, in terms of... of, of uh, some forts in the West that would be evacuated, some money that would be paid, a, a pretty unimportant treaty. But it showed a few things. Uh, one, it showed Washington's commitment to neutrality and avoiding foreign affairs, uh, foreign entanglements. And it also showed uh, the world that perhaps England and, and its uh, American cousins there were mending fences. Perhaps they were allying themselves again. Now, we're going to see that that's not really true, but to the world it seemed like it was, and especially to Spain. So Spain is going to negotiate the Pickney Treaty with the United States, uh, in part because they start to fear a strong United States-Great Britain alliance. Uh, the Pickney's Treaty is going to allow Americans to have access to the Mississippi River. Washington's famous farewell address, 
He says two very important things, avoid entangled alliances and avoid political parties. Uh, Americans are able to do at least half of that. All right, the development of political parties. Speaking of, uh, early political parties, of course, are founded by Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton founds a political party and he gives it the name Federalist. Somewhat confusing because we had talked about an earlier Federalist group, but we'll talk about that later. And Jefferson, of course, gives his party the nickname or the name Democratic Republicans because he too wants to confuse kids hundreds of years later. Uh, the Republicans are later is later dropped and this becomes the Democratic Party. Um, the election of 1796 was the first real election in American history, essentially. It was the first time that two political parties actively competed uh, for the presidency. John Adams will win this election, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. When we talk about political parties, I want to really encourage you to watch the voice thread. Uh, I only have a few more minutes left on this presentation, so I, I'm going to defer to that. And the Monroe Doctrine, uh, I, I actually think I put this in there by mistake. It doesn't really uh, apply to this. We'll talk about it later. So Jefferson, uh, John Adams wins the presidency and has to deal with foreign affairs as well. He has to deal with this impressment. This time, he has to deal with it with France. It's interesting when the Federalists are in power, France is the enemy. And when the Democratic Republicans are in power, England is seen as the enemy. It, it's, uh, it's different. They, they have different views on the two countries. So John Adams sends ambassadors to France to try to negotiate a treaty. And these ambassadors who go without a name, you know, in, in math, when you don't know the name, it's X, Y, Z. They demand a bribe, the XYZ affair. This angers Americans, a, a battle cry of millions of uh, millions for defense, not one penny in tribute is, uh, is popular among people. Adams gets involved in a pseudo or quasi-war with France. We're not really at war with France, but if we see their ships, we fire. If they see our ships, uh, they fire on us. Ironically enough, the war with the quasi war with France is fairly popular among most people. Not all people, though. And John Adams, who does not like the uh, criticism of his administration, passes these two laws the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Acts was seen as a way of denying new immigrants their right to vote. New immigrants generally supported Jefferson and, and the Democratic Republicans. The Sedition Acts limited people's freedom of speech. Um, Jefferson, John Adams' opponent here, uh, passed or, or wrote, helped to write, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions along with his good friend Madison. And the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions said, if a law is unconstitutional, like he believed these laws were, then the states can declare them to be unconstitutional. Now think about how dangerous this is. Essentially, states don't have to follow federal law if they don't want to. Jefferson is able to win the election, uh, the election of 1800, called a, a Revolution of 1800, and he deals with impressment in his own way, the Embargo Act. Jefferson says, we are not trading with anyone. Uh, and this is an excellent way to deal with impressment because if you're not trading with anyone, your, your sailors won't get uh, hijacked. But this destroyed the economy. So please don't miss my sarcasm here. The Embargo Act was not a good thing. Uh, it helped deal with impressment, but while doing so, it had devastating effects on the economy. Now, um, we see a lot of things with the Supreme Court in these chapters. And the, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, it's hard for me to go into depth on this presentation. But make sure that you know Marbury versus Madison. John Marshall, not the first Chief Justice, but in many ways, and in every way, he's the most important early Chief Justice. He really defines what the Supreme Court will be. Before John Marshall, the Supreme Court, there were real questions as to what its role was. And John Marshall, um, through Marbury versus Madison, declares a law unconstitutional. The specific law, the Judiciary Act of 1789, you don't really need to know that. But he exercised the power that the federal government, specifically the Supreme Court, has the power to declare laws unconstitutional, directly refuting this Virginia and Kentucky resolution. Uh, John Marshall uh, establishing that idea is going to greatly empower the, the Supreme Court as well as the federal government. And you can see how this goes against Jefferson's idea of having a less powerful federal government. Um, so make sure you review this case and, and this idea. Um, James Madison follows Thomas Jefferson. Uh, with seconds left, I'm going to encourage you strongly to look up these last two terms. Uh, 
I hope this one works. This is my second time doing this. You guys have a good night. We'll see you.